Good evening, I'm Paul Glassman, Director of Scholarly and Cultural Resources at Yeshiva University, and I'd like to welcome you to the second of our fall library book talks. Before I introduce our author and interviewer, I'd like to mention our upcoming library book talks. On Monday, December 5th, Rabbi Mordechai Schiffman will talk about Saif Torah, Cultivating Character and Well-Being Through the Weekly Parsha. And on Wednesday, December 14th, Rabbi Chaim Yachter and Binyamin Yachter, who will graduate from Yeshiva College next semester, will speak on Agadic Mindset, How Talmudic Tales Shape the Jewish Outlook. And next semester, we've scheduled the presentation by English professor Seamus O'Malley on Thursday, February 9th, on his new book, Irish Culture and the People, Populism and Its Discontents. Our author this evening is Douglas R. Burgess, Jr., Associate Professor and Chair of History. Professor Burgess's prior publications include The Pirate's Pact, The Secret Alliances Between History's Most Notorious Buccaneers and Colonial America, published in 2009, Engines of Empire, Steamships and the Victorian Imagination, published in 2016, and a chapter in the golden age of piracy, the rise, fall, and enduring popularity of pirates, published in 2018. All of these titles you can find in Yeshiva University libraries. Interviewing the author this evening is Matthew Incantalupo, assistant professor of political science, who last year co-authored Elite-Led Mobilization and Gay Rights, Dispelling the Myth of Mass Opinion Backlash published by University of Michigan Press. The subject of this evening's book talk is When Hope and History Rhyme, Natural Law and Human Rights from Ancient Greece to Modern America, published this year by Penguin Random House. I'm honored to turn the floor over to Professors Burgess and Incantalupo. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so before we get into what's in the book, uh, which I have right here, um, I, I want to ask you what's what's behind it. What's the story of this book? What's the intellectual journey that preceded it, and what led you to write it? I think the shortest answer is intense frustration, uh, and it goes all the way back to when I was a law student, because when you are a first year law student and you are dropped into what you expect to be a community of legal scholars you're actually effectively dropped into a bunch of auto mechanics because the law is taught to you as a trade rather than a discipline or a, a body of scholarship. So what was very much lacking in my legal education was anything like history. Um, and having come out the other end of that as a historian and a historian of the law, it always bothered me that no one had tried to put the law in any kind of historical context. Uh, there simply is no such thing as a textbook for the history of law. And I discovered that when I started teaching that class. So it actually began many years ago with just this desire to write that history. Uh, and I remember I, I, I shared this very, very hesitantly with uh, my colleague Ellen Schrecker. And she said, that's a wonderful idea, but you have to wait at least 10 years to do it because no one's going to take you seriously right now. And she's absolutely right. Uh, and I did. And by that time, a great deal had changed both for me and, and I think, frankly, uh, my understanding of, of the law. And I became fascinated with this one element of the law, especially uh, the idea of natural law and natural law rights. So I scaled down the project from something that would have been vast and sweeping and not only unwritable, but probably unreadable, uh, and came up with just looking at how this bare bones, almost like skeletal frame of natural law has come to define so much of what we understand about human rights today. And I got to bring in, uh, it's kind of like a favorite case. I got to talk about my favorite president, Michael Roosevelt, uh, and, and a great deal more besides. And take in, you know, my, my first work on legal scholarship was actually on piracy and terrorism. And even that came into play. Um, so so it's, been, it's been a long time coming uh, and I'm still kind of coming down from the high of seeing it published and, and have it be done. I mean, you can relate to this, that once the book is in print, you don't have to keep revising it, um, at least for a couple of years. So, but yeah, that's that's kind of how we got here. And congratulations on, you know, I, 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 I think it was, it was excellent. I thought the, 
the amount of ground you cover, both in terms of uh, just like tracing this idea through you know, multiple, going back to the ancients um, across multiple cultural contexts. It was, you know, it was really remarkable. You end, um, uh, well, you, you both begin and end the book uh, talking a lot about natural law and human rights with respect to foreign policy. Uh, you, know, you, you, you talk in the beginning of the book about all the attention that natural law and human rights have gotten from political philosophers, mostly talking about our relationship with the state, with our own government, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you said there's next to no one applying these same ideas to foreign policy. Why do you think that is? I think that in a sense, I think I used this metaphor in, in, in the book itself, I feel like natural law is kind of like the Tempietto. It's kind of like this tiny little structure inside this enormous cathedral. And we kind of lost sight of it uh, within the larger structure. We still reference natural law principles every time we talk about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's, that's inescapable. We live in a natural law legal structure. Um, and every time we talk about universal human rights, we are necessarily referencing natural law because what else could those rights be based on, which is what I wrote the book about. But I think that that awareness has been lost. Uh, and I think that especially now in the 21st century, where anyone who wants to champion human rights almost immediately runs into a brick wall of cultural relativism, there has to be a way to engage in that conversation without simply repeating the same old tropes. And one of the things that, that was particularly frustrating was it was very hard to extricate human rights from uh, Western liberalism, and especially this idea that, that a, a human rights government is necessarily, or at least ideally, also a democratic government. And to me, that actually has been a, a hindrance, a, a fetter on our foreign policy for decades now, and something that we finally have the opportunity to move beyond. Well, so I'm gonna stay kind of focused on our own, our own democracy. So you talked early on about US willingness and obligations to intervene in the face of human rights abuses. So I couldn't help but think um, about connections to the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the response by the United States and its NATO allies. So you know, the response is short of a full military intervention, but it's quite militarized. Um, and it seems that this unwillingness to go beyond providing defensive weapons uh, and equipment is because of fears of provoking a larger, perhaps nuclear conflict with Russia. So, so this approach, which I'll call it help with restraint, um, is this consistent with a natural law approach to foreign policy? And, and also, are we protecting even more lives and the one planet we have, um, uh, you know, at the expense of having Ukraine do all its own fighting? Well, first of all, I have to say that there is absolutely nothing more terrifying to historians than the news. Uh, we, are, we are much more comfortable with events when they're in the past and when everyone we talk about is safely dead. And we're really bad at predicting the future. Uh, I myself, I, in fact, this is a perfect example of that. I walked into class on the day that Russia invaded Ukraine, and I basically told my students, I never do this, but I mean, for once I thought, okay, you know, I said, well, we all know how this is going to end. Uh, and I sort of blithely said, okay, well, this is a country that has an enormous amount of, of, of uh, political and, and military will. It's, it's, it, I kind of imagined it's sort of like Chechnya Park II. Uh, so, and it hasn't turned out like that. And I think that one of the main reasons that it hasn't turned out like that is American hate, uh, something that simply wasn't present before. I mean, this is, this is a, uh, an incredibly decisive factor, which frankly, I think we're still kind of understanding the parameters of. I mean, it's not just that we're sending in the guns. Uh, some of the most interesting articles I read had to do with just the, the sudden and frankly novel willingness of the American intelligence services to share information with the Ukrainians, which is actually surprisingly rare. You'd think with the allies, especially allies that are giving money and, and weapons to, that that would be a matter of course, and it really isn't. So uh, in, in, the, in the framework of human rights, it's, it's much easier to deal with abuses once they're safely in the past. And this is why most of the arguments in the book kind of ground themselves in the idea of some kind of international tribunal. And I always get asked, uh, well, could you imagine someone like Vladimir Putin on trial for war crimes? And I'm like, okay, imagine it's 1939. Could you imagine someone like Hermann Goering on trial for war crimes? Sure, why not? Uh, it's, it's not impossible. Um, it's not even entirely unlikely. 
So that's kind of where I would put my emphasis, less on, on the sort of real politic decisions being made in the moment and more in the aftermath. I mean, before we could even talk about uh, offenses and you know, criminal offenses under the ICC, we'd have to have some sort of investigation to determine exactly what those were uh, and who exactly was responsible. And that's something that generally takes place after a war rather than, than during. So for the moment, I can only say that I'm ecstatic that the United States is doing as much as it is. I hope that they continue to do so. Uh, it's, it's a matter of concern to me that we might actually be doing something profoundly right. And there might be people who would say, oh, but we shouldn't keep doing that. Um, so I hope with the next Congress that it's every bit as, as committed to this policy as the previous Congress has been. Um, all right, so this brings me to a somewhat broader question and something I kind of struggled with as I was making my way uh, you know, through the book. Um, you know, it seems like natural law is a good guide for what government or society ought to do or, or not do. Uh, but it says far less about how we ought to do. Um, so in other words, to go back to Ukraine, uh, you know, natural law tells us we have this duty to help Ukraine, but it doesn't tell us exactly what that help should look like. Um, natural law says that government needs to respect property rights, um, but what does it tell us about how to design the right tax code that's efficient and just and does all the things we want? You know, I, I, I teach public policy, so some of expect this a lot. I'm always teaching students that it's, it's you know the details and the implementation and actually getting the policies out that's the tricky part. We always know what we'd like to do. Um, we just don't know how to get there without potentially creating other problems. And I, I struggle with this a bit, you know, through the text that, that natural law gives us direction or valence, but it doesn't necessarily, you know, like, like, like I, it was Churchill that called it a star, right? Oh, he called it the, uh, the electric charter the, the star. The electric yeah. charter a star, yeah. you know, something to navigate towards, but, but, you know, are you going to go towards that star by boat? Are you going to go on foot? Like, we don't, you know, this is, this is what I sort of struggle with throughout the text. Well, I mean, that struggle is centuries old. And it's because when you go all the way back to Cicero, you're given this vision of natural law existing in the mind of Jupiter. Uh, it is immutable, it is perfect, and it is like the, you know, Churchill's star. You can never reach it, but you can always see it. But the funny thing is, when you hold that out in front of uh, humanity, they'll always strive towards it, even when they know they'll never reach it. And this is one of the most beautiful aspects, not just of natural law, but of, of the evolution of the law in human society, is that we're constantly moving closer. We're always moving closer. Uh, in spite of setbacks and reverses and disasters and catastrophes, we still, that, that upward slope of human evolution is absolutely there in the law. I wouldn't speak to another field of endeavor, but in the law, it's discernible. You can, you can practically map it. Um, it's in the details where everything falls apart. And this is where you see any number of, of philosophers start to hedge their bets. I mean, even Plato speaks of themis and DK. So themis being sort of the universal absolute and DK being tax codes. Um, and, but I think that maybe one way to distinguish natural law from everything else is to say, if we stick to the, the four basics, uh, the natural rights to life, liberty, property, security, each of those to a certain degree is already hedged in. We don't have an unlimited right to liberty, for example, um, and we don't have an unlimited right to property. We have the right to acquire. We don't have the right to take someone else's. So I think that that's kind of what the law does is if you look at, for example, American constitutional law, it takes something like the Bill of Rights and then spends two plus centuries refining it. What exactly is the right to life? When, you know, what, under what circumstances can it can be violated? So, yeah, I mean, the implementation is always going to be the problem, but in a sense, it's not really my problem um, because <laughs> what I'm trying to do here isn't so much say, you know, to give a, a sort of instant algorithm for when and how to apply each instance, which I think would be impossible and, and the job of states. Um, it's more like, here's the basic fundamentals that we always have to heed back to. And especially in the field of international human rights, this is, this is our star. This is what we have to constantly be looking towards because these fundamental natural rights are the ones that when they are abridged, the consequences are the most dire. So you do you know, this really masterful job demonstrating that natural law has existed at least as far back as ancient Greece, um, that it's convergently evolved in multiple cultural and religious traditions. 
So why did it take until the late 1700s or so to be fully incorporated as natural rights and begin to form the basis of government? And then as a follow-up to that, why did we see pretty rapid backsliding on that in the 19th century? Well, this might be this might be my family speaking, but I blame the Protestants. Um, and I'm actually not kidding. Uh, I think that what you find in the, in the 17th century, especially uh, 16th century, but really in the 17th century, is the evolution of this idea that you can see in, in the writings of Theologius, for example, of the individual. Um, and Protestantism as a faith begins in this individual act of protest. I do not accept this is true. And the I is a necessary qualifier on that statement. So once you have the individual being kind of reintroduced back into Western society, then I can, you, can, you can map out the transition from natural law as a species of justice. You know, this, you know the Cicero talks about uh, collective justice, you know, the, uh, the safety of the people is the highest good, right? By the time you get to certainly uh, the end of the 17th century, you're, you're looking at a completely different understanding of what natural law is, that it's individual rights, it's the state's obligation to protect individual rights under the law. And I, you can, I think, map that out by looking at how the role of the individual changes in, in Western society. And then to speak to the 19th century, it's actually one of the great tragedies, in my opinion, in, in world history is that just about the same time that we really began to grapple with this idea of natural rights, so at the end of the 18th century, the beginning of the 19th century, uh, then it all just frankly goes to hell. Um, and and, it, it, and in, the, in the most tragic possible way, because some of the same individuals like William Wilberforce in, uh, in, in the British Parliament uh, led the charge to abolish the slave trade in Britain, and yet, also led the charge uh, to completely radically transform Indian law under the Raj. Uh, so it, it used to be you know, under the idea of benign neglect that the empire would more or less kind of leave cultural practices in place or at least be more cautious about what they wanted to change. But now all of a sudden you have this kind of imperial liberalism that says, oh no, we can't do that. We have to bring everyone else up to our standard. And that that is the curse that we live under now, because that's the beginning of cultural relativism. That's the beginning of all of those, especially those formerly colonized nations, saying to us now, how dare you criticize these practices when uh, all this is is neo-imperialism. They're just doing the same thing that, that the British government did. And that's actually kind of the stumbling block that I wanted to overcome. How can we talk to those nations and all nations and articulate this language of, of universal right without constantly getting trapped by, by our own past. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, the, the sort of Western or American democracy with respect to human rights is a theme we come back to. I, I sort of read it as, as you know, we, we came up with these concepts, we had these ideas, but um, we didn't fully incorporate them as universal. We actually initially um, used them as a sign that you're part of it. Oh yeah, you know, you're you're the you're the property owner. You you're a voter. You know you have these things. So so they were I think initially these things were you know sort of derived. They were status markers at first. It probably wasn't until well into the 20th century that they really became human rights. Oh sure, I mean and and they're absorbed especially in the 19th century within a much larger narrative that has everything you know. The, the, Christianity and, and starch collars and shirt waists and everything, you know? Uh, one of those sort of the minor tragedies in the, in the overall tragedy uh, was I discovered this incredible document that was a kind of a bill of rights for India written by Queen Victoria. And the crazy thing was it was actually written by Queen Victoria. And it was distributed to the Viceroy and it was supposed to be disseminated throughout the Raj. And all of a sudden it just sort of magically disappears. I mean, she lives for another 40 years and somehow the thing just never shows up again. And it really, it always came down to implementation. And this was a document that laid out religious freedom, um, respect for cultural practices, equality under the law, equality uh, for you know, hiring practices. Um, she was setting out like quotas for the civil, uh, civil service and they pretty much just tossed it to one side. So yeah, it's, it's, it is tragic because you can see the glimmering of something absolutely beautiful, especially at the beginning of the 19th century, 
uh, where there's this recognition that if you take the ideas of natural law to their logical conclusions, it would abolish slavery, it would emancipate women, um, it would introduce radical uh, egalitarianism in human society, and then it all just, I don't want to say it all falls apart, uh, but it definitely gets absorbed into a very different narrative. And that's why I think it takes until the middle of the 20th century in the aftermath of the Second World War to kind of return back to that, that basic idea. Right. So great, this is a great transition to where I want to head next, which is do major advances in our understanding of human rights and, and, and how we advocate them, do they first require major setbacks or atrocity, right? Where, you know, supposed to be able to arrive at these ideas naturally through uh, what you call on, on page 111, an instinct for justice. Um, and yet it seems that the biggest evolutions on this concept um, happen following world wars, genocides, other types of atrocities. So why does it, why do we always have to break things before we can make them better, right? It seems like we're more guided by our horror or our repulse or regret than this, you know, enlightenment logic. I don't want to go on record as saying it takes an atrocity to produce a recognition of human rights and their value. What I would say is that if you think about the aftermath of the Second World War, uh, I think if you go to the words of Justice Robert Jackson, who was the, the chief prosecutor of Nuremberg, Jackson said, civilization itself is the real complaining party at the bar. The idea being, if we can't put these Nazis on trial and give them the benefit of the law and give them the presumption of innocence, if we are incapable of that, then effectively there is no such thing as civilization. So I think it's less about an atrocity bringing us to this point in more what the atrocity does. The atrocity brings us to a moment where we basically have to decide what it is we truly believe in. Uh, and I always, in my mind, I always go back to Nuremberg because it's, it's, it's not only the aftermath of the largest recorded atrocity in human history, it's also a moment where the vast majority of people in the United States did not support the idea of a tribunal uh, initially. And, uh, and some of the people that you would expect to support it and some people that you didn't, that, that wouldn't, I mean, they're on the wrong side. I mean, you had someone like Henry Morgenthau Jr., who was one of the first people in Roosevelt's cabinet to, to bring awareness to the Holocaust, uh, advocating the Ruhr Plan and advocating you know, the execution of, of Nazi leadership because he was so horrified by what he saw. And then you have someone like uh, Secretary of War Henry Simpson, who it was a card-carrying anti-Semite, um, and at the same <laughs> time saying, no, we have to, we, you know, we have to uphold principles of justice. So I think it's more really about just having to decide in that moment, is this what we are? Are we capable of, of, of preserving this even at the worst possible moment? And I think you know, people don't realize that uh, the stakes at Nuremberg were much higher, I think, than you know, in retrospect they seem. The idea of a trial, I talked about, talk about this, a trial in Western law, especially in, in common law nations, begins by erasing everything. Uh, there's no Holocaust, there's no Nazis, there's no crime. Um, and then you, you have to, once you've erased that, that's what the presumption of innocence does, then you have to fill that slate in with the evidence. And then it's only with the conviction that that narrative is proved to be true, which is why uh, in subsequent tribunals and in subsequent trials, you have some wackadoo lawyers who will go in there and try and deny the Holocaust. Um, because in a trial, the trial is the only place where you could do that and have it be even permissible, even if it's still unconscionable. Uh, let's just give a shout out to a movie I just watched recently, absolutely wonderful movie, and I don't recommend it very often, but this one uh, has to do with the David Irving, um, I should call it David Irving trial because he wasn't the one on trial, um, but it was the, a, a civil case um, uh, called, and, and the movie's called Denial. Um, you can watch it, it's just an amazing movie. And it's about when a Holocaust denier accuses a, a, an historian of the Holocaust of defaming him. And they go on trial at the Old Bailey in London. And it's just, and it's all true and it's absolutely amazing. All right, I will definitely check it out. Um, okay, so, you know, things like this kind of crystallize our incorporation of human rights and, and you know, and <clears throat> natural law into our, our foreign policy. And then you talk about a sharp change 
from this foreign policy grounded in human rights and natural law to the Trump administration's highly transactional foreign policy. Um, I'm not an international relations scholar, uh, but I, you know, I know that so much of, of international relations comes down to commitments and maintaining one's commitments. So how did this shift affect our commitments? And you know, is it possible to repair commitments once you've, once you've broken them? Those are two very separate questions with, in a sense, very different answers. Uh, it's always possible to repair the, the commitments that are broken, but like anything that's repaired, it's never quite the same again. Uh, and we've seen, if you start with, with Woodrow Wilson's moral diplomacy, um, which conveniently is exactly 100 years ago, and you, and you pull it up to the present day, different presidents have had a very different conception of uh, their obligations to the, to the global community. But no president, even, even those that might secretly have believed it, no president ever came before the world stage and declared themselves to be purely transactional. And then, and that instruction filtered, filtered down to all of the, the varying departments. I mean, you have Nikki Haley describing the ICC as, as irretrievably corrupt. You have Mike Pompeo saying that, that what the Saudis were doing was terrible, but it really wasn't any of our business. I mean, it was just, no one had ever been so brazen as to say, actually, we're just going to take a purely transactional, utterly immoral uh, approach to, to human rights. Uh, we're not even going to pretend to care uh, what other nations are, are doing. Uh, we just want what's best for the United States. It, it's, what's interesting about that is that in, other, in another time, in another language, that's real politics. And there's whole classes, some of which are taught by people that you know, you know, um, on that. And and that alone isn't so bad. That 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 uh, the nation's leaders should look after its own self-interest. That could even be a moral obligation. But the idea that we simply wouldn't even care about the rest, not only not care, but actively defend some of the worst worst abuses of human rights. And to me, neither of those, if, if this is an indictment uh, of, of former President Trump, to me, the thing that was the most disturbing wasn't just that, that we abandoned a whole slew of our international obligations, it's that we abandoned the institutions themselves. Uh, that, for heaven's sake, we froze the assets of the director of the ICC because they questioned whether or not they might at some point investigate whether the United States committed war crimes in Afghanistan. We Took away their car. I mean, this is, uh, it was shocking to me. And what was even more shocking was that I didn't know about any of this. Um, that, in a sense, the, the deluge had buried this. And the more I found out about it, the creepier it got. Um, that there wasn't, it wasn't just a kind of a, a blind ignorance at work here. There was something quite direct and malevolent under that. Um, and I think that, that, when you talk about repairing what's broken, it's not just about going back into the trees and, and sort of crossing out John Bolton's name everywhere. Um, it's, it's much more about saying, yes, uh, it's possible if this happened once, it could happen again, um, either with the man himself or some other terrifying iteration of him. Uh, but if we can't prevent that, at least we can do as much good now as possible and maybe lay down the framework where it's more difficult for somebody in the future to just arbitrarily pull themselves out of these, these obligations. So, so the, you know, moving to the, the Biden administration really seems like a return to some of that 20th century idea of building alliances, leaning on our commitments, leaning on our allies, but as well as leading them. Um, you know, I think there's a sort of, sort of, again, you know, surprising just how, much the U.S. has done in Europe, and how much you know the U.S. has been able to kind of keep European allies moving together, especially since you know, they're the ones sort of facing the even higher energy prices and things like that. Um, you know, I think you know maybe it's because he's actually like this is an example of where our president being quite old or older is, is is really helpful. I think I think he lacks um, you know his predecessor Barack Obama's like, cynicism about cooperation, having to become a little earlier. He certainly seems to lack Bush's, you know, go it alone. 
um, attitude. So, you know, I'm not asking you to add another chapter to your book, um, maybe for the second edition, uh, but, you know, if you, if you were, uh, you know, pushing this book a little into the future, what's your, what's your assessment of, of the administration's performance on, on human rights and how they're incorporating or reincorporating them into foreign policy? I have to say that on one level, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised because I did not expect that a soon-to-be octogenarian cold warrior uh, would be able to engage with especially uh, European heads of state who are much younger and from a very different generation in every sense of the word than, than, than he is. I actually worried, even though I obviously supported the administration, I worried about that aspect um, because I thought, oh gosh, if he goes in there and starts digging up old, I don't want you know, like old Reagan lines and, um, and shining city on a hill, we're doomed. Um, because, because they've already seen what the reverse looks like. Because if we do go before the, the, uh, the world stage and present ourselves as the shining city on the hill, having just been you know, the worst pit for the last, I'm being a little carried away, but you get the idea. Um, I think that, that it would be very hard to take it seriously. So that was, it's surprising to me how adept he's proven to be at this. Um, and again, I, I speak from a position of profound ignorance because I don't know any more than what I've been able to read about the actual uh, diplomatic negotiations um, that, that have taken place that have so quickly brought this, this alliance together and, and held it in place. Uh, I think everybody, I dare say even a, a number of foreign policy specialists were kind of stunned by that, um, that we were able to uh, create this united front, not alone, but um, this certainly happens to be a part of it. And now I can only hope that it lasts. I mean, it's, it's way too early to, to speak of like the legacy of the administration, especially since they're only two years in, and we don't know how any of this is gonna turn out. But just that fact alone, that after four years of Trump and uh, in spite of all of that, we were able to bring that coalition together as rapidly as it was, is, is kind of hard. All right, just a few more questions before we open it up. Um, I want to circle back to um, natural law evolving from something that divinely inspired, you know, the mind of Jupiter or, you know, something like that, um, to, to being the set of principles we derive through body and reading, um, it's kind of enlightenment ideal. Um, even to, the, today, like among Americans, if you went out and, and on the survey research group. So you went out and polled people and you said, um, do our rights come from you know, God or the creator or something like that? Or do our unalienable rights come from some sort of notion, a more secular notion of human dignity? Um, you would find you know, a large group of Americans endorse one perspective and, and, and another. Um, so how do you think people who today you know, conceptualize the same rights, natural, you know, natural rights, whatever you want to uh, call them from either being divinely inspired or sort of coming from secular origins. Um, how do people today differ, even though, you know, they agree on these sort of same principles, but they're coming from, from different perspectives? How do you think it sort of shapes other, other attitudes they have? Well, I think that, that uh, it doesn't really matter for our purposes whether you believe that natural law comes from the mind of God and is therefore a moral impulse that's imbued in all human beings, or if you believe that that moral impulse is there absent God, that it's simply there. Uh, but either way, in order to accept any premise of right under the law, you pretty much end up circling back to it. Because if you take it away, if you say, all right, there's, there's no natural impulse towards justice, there's no natural understanding of, of, of rights, then what you're left with is simply the state determining what is right and wrong and what is legal and illegal. And uh, oh, good, I get to drop, I get to name drop Michel Foucault. Um, I was trying to do this once in the yeah. interview. Uh, yeah, it, it, then it becomes power relations, right? Um, and that's all it is, and nothing else. It's neither moral nor, nor immoral. It's just this is what the state wants to do, and this is how it's going to do it. So I don't think you would find many people on the street that would support the idea that states should have the unimpeded power to determine whatever they want in terms of the law. And when, especially Americans, speak of rights and you say, where do your rights come from? Most of them would probably say the Bill of Rights. And then when you look at the Bill of Rights, where does that come from? Oh, it comes from natural law. I mean, <laughs> there's no way around it. Those, the rights that are being enshrined, those, uh, you know, the, the first and foremost of them are natural law rights. 
So whether they they know that they're living inside of that natural natural law legal structure or not, they definitely still are. All right. So something maybe you know a couple of light ones just to, to end this, and then we'll, we'll open it up. Um, you're a professor. You assign reading for a living. It's at least part of what you do. Um, uh, if you could have one person read this book, who would it be? <laughs> You should never ask a story that because <laughs> Franklin Roosevelt, <laughs> so unfair. Do you know that I never? I'm, I live in Hyde Park, mm -hmm. and I I live about less than a mile from his house. And this is going to sound really fanboy, but I have gone there probably a hundred times. And when the book came out, I actually I didn't you know go to the grave, no, no, no. But I did go. I sort of stood by the grave and I was like. Hope you know about this somehow. You know? <laughs> so, um, but among the living, I think obviously the, 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 the easiest answer would be, would be the president. Um, I mean, this is what I think everyone dreams is that, that the thing that you spend all this time working on somehow ends up in the hands of the president of the United States and you actually get to make a difference. And how often do you get to do that? Um, but even, even so, I think if I had to pick between the two presidents, it would probably be FDR. <laughs> All right, so um, yeah, congratulations. Obviously, take a long victory lap as you're completing <laughs> this, this wonderful book. Um, but what are you thinking about next? Oh. <laughs> Sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, I, what I'm thinking about right now is sort of return to my roots a bit. Uh, I the, what I wrote my doctor, doctoral dissertation on was uh, colonial understandings of criminality. And I focused kind of narrowly on piracy and because it was just so much fun. And if you have to be a graduate student, the best place to be a graduate student is Jamaica. Um, so, but now all these years later, I've kind of thought that I'd like to go back and make that a broader question. Um, I love all these, the discussions of criminality within, in colonial America because what you have is a completely different legal structure building up under England's nose, but largely without England's knowledge. So I'd kind of I'd kind of like to blow that idea open and maybe write a, a second book to correlate to that one to look at, at other things besides just piracy. Very cool. Um, so I think maybe we should open up to either people in the room for questions or ones we might have received uh, via chat on Zoom. Uh, Bob, do you wanna? Are there any questions in the room to start with? If not, are there any on the in the chat? Yeah. No questions. Please. I know that you're a fan of, I mean, not your the class, I'm not, but of keeping the law, keeping the system of law, like despite any any other uh, considerations. But when you have, you spoke about the Nuremberg trials, when you have trials of that nature where the crime is just so big, I right? think about like Eichmann trials, opposed to just like showing that to the public. When you have crimes that big, it just like strikes you. Like how, why, why do we need, need, need a trial, something like that? Good question. Um, and I get to give a shout out to another movie, which is always fun. Uh, but it was a Broadway play first, so I can, I can do that. It was Robert Bolt's play, A Man for All Seasons. And it's about the former uh, Lord Chancellor of England, Sir Thomas More, who wrote Utopia. Um, and Moore actually died because as a Catholic, he refused to accept Henry's divorce to uh, a divorce from Catherine of Aragon, even though he never actually opposed it, he just refused to endorse it. So at one point, his firebrand son-in-law, William Roper, says to him, I would tear down every law in England to get the devil. And Moore says, and when the last law is down and the devil turns round on you, where will you hide the laws all being flat? This nation is planted thick with laws from coast to coast, man's laws, not God's. Tear them down, and do you really believe you could stand upright in the winds that would blow them? Yes, I give the devil the benefit of the law for my own safety's sake. And I think that that idea, and by the way, um, Justice Felix Frankfurter was sitting in the audience when that play debuted um, on Broadway, and he literally banged on the guy in front of him. He's like, that's it, that's it, that's the law, right? That idea that a trial is most necessary in the times when, when the guilt of the accused is so obvious and so appalling, 
That's one of the most profound ideas that the law has ever introduced. And I think that Nuremberg is a brilliant illustration of that. Um, and, and in a way, the Eichmann trial is as well. But the Eichmann trial was very, very different because the, uh, the goals of the Eichmann trial were different. It wasn't just establishing guilt or innocence of the accused. It was creating a kind of a legal narrative to provide voice to the victims of the Holocaust. Um, so, but just the, the basic idea that, that there could be such a thing as a crime too great for the law undercuts the very idea, not just of what the law is, but what civilization is. That line, when I said about you know, civilization being the complaining party at the bar, you haven't, you haven't read Justice Jackson's address for the prosecution, but in another couple of weeks you will. Um, and uh, I don't think I've ever read anything more beautiful in my life. Um, because the, the basic idea is, of course they're guilty, but we have to run the risk of giving them the presumption of innocence because the only thing more appalling than their guilt would be a lack of justice afterwards to simply line them up and, and, and shoot them. It's not a precedent. It doesn't establish anything in history. They just, they were alive one minute and they're dead the next. But to give them a trial, provides a complete narrative of the crime. And it tells people as it does today, this is what they did. This is what they were guilty of. So, and it's, and those trials are hard. Um, I think Nuremberg still kind of stands as the benchmark that the very few other tribunals have reached. Uh, and, and necessarily so, because they will always involve political considerations well beyond the establishment of guilt and innocence. But I don't think that changes the fact that, that you have to try, that, that, that there's a reason why they have to be. Jeff, please. Um, so you, you, um, you mentioned in your um, introductory comments that what lay behind this project was a, a wish to fill a hole. Uh, you didn't think it was an adequate um, historical account of, of the subject. And uh, it, it strikes me, though, that in some ways, um, what you're suggesting is that um, this, is a hit, this is a history without um, really the element of change, or, not, or, the, or the element of change is not being foregrounded, right? You see a certain continuity that runs through uh, these various doctrines, right, from, from uh, natural law to the Jeffersonian doctrine of rights to the uh, kind of um, universal doctrine of rights that is that is at play in the um, in the Nuremberg Tribunal. And I guess what, what I'm struggling to, uh, I wonder if you could help, if you could articulate, what is the continuity? In other words, what is the, what, what is it that connects, uh, let's say, uh, Thomas Aquinas's notion of natural law to the Jeffersonian notion of rights, which of course has to do with um, with citizenship mm -hmm. and they and the um, uh, and the doctrine that animates the Nuremberg trial. So, what is the what what is the connecting the connecting thread? I like to start with the idea of the mind of God, even though by the time we get to the 17th century, we can sort of you know post Grotius, we can kind of put that to one side. Not so much the actual mind of God, but the idea that there is this perfect form out there, uh, and that we throughout history have been striving towards it. So the element of change, which is actually provides the, the narrative framework of the book is, is evolution mm -hmm. um, from this very, very basic idea that you find, you know, I mentioned Cicero, but you find it in multiple different legal systems, this idea that there is an impulse towards justice and we reference it from some kind of, of immutable divine, that basic idea which then originally just spoke to justice, didn't go any further than that. It's just, you know, that, that uh, a king should be just towards his people uh, because he's not only answerable to them or to himself, but he's answerable to the divine. Um, that idea evolves over time until you get to uh, the Renaissance and the Enlightenment and you begin to see it shift into this idea that it's not just justice, it's not just referencing the divine mind, this immutable to unknowable truth, it's that it's vested within us in the form of individual human rights. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think you really can, in a sense, take the divine immutable out of the equation or at least not worry about it as much because it's much easier to focus on those rights that we are that are immutable because they are born into every single human being. Um, life, liberty, property, uh, these security, these are natural law rights, 
because they're the only things that we have that do not depend in any way on someone else, the community or our parents or anyone. It's, these are things that exist innate to us. And if they exist innate to us, we must have some kind of dominion over them. And I think that was the realization that comes uh, for, for like mid 17th century. And that's what's still working itself out right up until the present day, is that if these rights are absolute, how then do we frame all of the other rights that we now understand as, as critical? Um, the right to vote, uh, the right to free speech. Uh, not all of them will fit easily within this, this framework. So I think that's kind of where we are now on this narrative track is that we're, <clears throat> we're trying to distinguish between these fundamental rights and what they mean in the law and where do we then find the place for all of these other things that we still consider to be rights, but don't strike at something innate to ourselves. So the immutable aspect, I think, would always come down to that which we are innately born with, that which cannot change because every human, you know, born, uh, 10,000 years ago, born 10,000 years from now, they will always have these same, you know, the same kind of basic pre-code. Uh -huh. um, but added to that will be so much more that they will get depending on the community that they live in. Uh, and this, I think, I mean, this is, this is kind of the narrative that's taking place in the UN right now, is how do we, how can we preference one right over another? And, and one of the more frustrating aspects of, of human rights law is that Nowhere in the UN is there a document that lays out, okay, this right, but this one should come first. They're just lists, right? Um, I have my students read for one of the classes, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's got 32 provisions. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yeah, life, liberty, property, and security are there. So is, uh, you know, the right to paid vacation. So I think that's what we're working through now. Um, and it's impossible to say where it's going. But this is, you know, what I think in your question, there was kind of, I, I was hearing sort of the unspoken words long durée. Um, and in my answer, I'm, I'm giving the, the equally sort of hesitant, tiny, 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 tiny little bit of nod to the history, um, only in as much as, as saying that in this particular avenue, I don't think it would be appropriate to dismiss the idea of progress. I mean, so do you think that something like the Jeffersonian doctrine exists in embryo in earlier uh, understandings of, of uh, natural law? Is that is that the claim you're making that it's sort of? I think it, no, because I think what you're trying to do is, is sort of work backwards in, in a sense mm -hmm. and say no. What I'm saying is that that if we the reason I keep talking about the mind of God is that the idea of the mind of God and the mind of Jupiter sister says is that every successive generation knows more of the mind of God than the one before. Necessarily so. That's the upward progress, is that every generation knows more of the mind of God than the one before. Take God out of the equation, and it's, uh, what is that line? No, T sort of tones like that. You would know this. That, you know, know thyself, right? So we, we, we learn more about ourselves, essentially, with each, each successive generation. So I don't think it's quite fair to sort of work backwards and say, can we apply this Jeffersonian principle to Edward I? You know, it's more that as we know more about that universal, be it the mind of God or, or that, that universal within ourselves, it manifests itself in, in new and differing ways. Please. Um. I know that obviously since the beginning of time, this law has kind of been something that's been developing and changing. Is there a point at which you think law needs to continue developing, especially in the United States, or have we reached a point where we're kind of pushing too far? Does that make sense? Well, there's a wonderful but very boring historian of uh, English constitutional history. I think I may mention in the class F.W. Maitland. And he described, he's been dead for hundred years, so I can say that. Um, and he described, when he talk, talked about the body of law, he said that the, the metaphor actually works better than people realize because a body is composed of cells and each of those cells is not just a law, it's a legislator um, and they will die. And then someone else will come along after them. And he basically just describes the law, the living body of the law as an aggregate of all of these individual acts, um, past, present and future. So the living body, yes, it changes, it evolves, it moves through time. Um, we can say that there could be some avenues of the law 
that are either redundant or have reached their state of development or whatever without saying that the law um, has reached that point. I don't think it's possible to say, ever really say that the law has reached its final absolute state of, of perfection. It surely hasn't now. Um, and and you know, the corollary question is, what would that perfection even look like? I mean, I think the, the vision of the Renaissance scholars was, to use a Renaissance term, utopia. Um, that the law will, will become perfect when it ceases to exist, when we no longer need it. Uh, and I don't think that's uh, far beyond being like a realistic goal. It's not even one that we really need to, to consider. It's more that we can continue to, to progress and accept that trajectory without ever having to worry about the end. And so there's really no end. Um, you know, we, just as we continue to evolve and uh, and make mistakes and, and go back and fix them. So to the law is basically just a kind of a codified soul. It, it's us. It's moving through time in, at the same speed that we are and changing in the same ways that we change. We have some uh, questions coming in from Jack. Please. Kaylee asks that um, earlier, you had mentioned cultural relativism several mm -hmm. times, and he was wondering, would you also be grouping moral relativism in with that as well? Additionally, how do you determine right or wrong when every society seems to have its own set of laws? Well, that I think those are three different versions of the same basic idea. Um, cultural relativism comes down to the idea that each culture and the state, therefore, as the representation of that culture in law, uh, gets to determine for itself what is right and wrong. So there you get back to moral relativism. It's the same, you know, when we hear the, the term moral relativism, we automatically sort of, it, 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 it raises up dragons. Um, but those are the same idea, uh, that, that each individual community has evolved differently and has different understandings of the law, and therefore other communities whose understandings may be different should respect that. You can say that um, without necessarily saying, but every community has or could have different understandings of absolute right or wrong. Uh, in other words, at what point, if you have a community that says it's perfectly all right to engage in mass murder, then is this, you know, under the sort of the cultural relativist position, uh, sure, why not? I mean, take the argument to its logical conclusion. If every culture has the right to determine right and wrong, there's no Rwandan genocide, right? Didn't happen, who cares, right? So that, that fact, um, that's what sort of flies in the, in the face of this natural law idea, which says that there can be certain universal principles uh, in, in law and justice that can exist and do exist in every society. Um, and therefore something like the Rwandan genocide would never be a reflection of Rwandan culture, it isn't. It's an aberration, necessarily so, it has to be so, couldn't be anything else. And that's the argument that we could advance to uh, some of the more powerful and egregious dictators around the world as they continue to uh, oppress their peoples, is if, if what they're doing impinges on a natural law right, they can't simply say, oh, but we've been doing this for centuries and we always did this and this is, how, this is just how things are done. So, so yeah, I think that, that the cultural relativism and moral relativism, it's, it's all kind of the same question. Another question we have from Ronnie. Ronnie asked, why is it better to lie diplomatically and still not care about human rights abuses than just make that your policy? Boy, if there were ever a loaded trick question, that would be that. Um, I, I, I disagree with the framework because it suggests that it's impossible to engage in anything other than a duplicitous, uh, completely real politic foreign policy. And that's just simply not the case. Uh, the United States at various times and for much of its, at least its last century of history has done exactly that. Um, so, so no, I don't think this is a question of, of wouldn't it be better if we just stopped lying and said that we're evil? Um, no, I, it's, it's, it's never going to be that simple. At the same time, a head of state, the, the oath that the president of the United States takes is to defend and protect the Constitution of the people of the United States. 
not the rest of the world. So there is a moral and legal obligation to engage in uh, diplomacy that will favor the United States. Um, but I don't think that those two things are necessarily contradictory. I think that the best presidents have, have proven themselves to be adept at doing both. And in some cases, uh, bonus points for having been able to accomplish something that's both altruistic and good for the United States. Um, and that's, you know, that's what I think there's at least 35 think tanks on K Street that just do nothing else all day except come up with that kind of stuff. So it's possible. Can I ask that question? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Aiden. You uh, you mentioned you mentioned how we can't how we have to pose go and go into other cultures and to say there has to be something right. You can't just commit your trip on a genocide. How do you feel about the concept of when the British showed up to India and the Indians said it's our culture, we've been widow burning forever, and the British said we respect your culture, we, we acknowledge it, but it's our culture to kill the people who do widow burning. To view that as kind of the perspective when you go out into the world, where, it's, where the, those two ideas can both co do you think they can coexist? Or is that like just a really bad argument? I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. No, I, I do, but, but two things before I answer you. First, this is weirdly like Charlie's Angels. Because um, I'm like staring into the little camera thing, but the other thing is that that uh, I, I think I missed a, a bit of what you were saying um, because it's coming out of this tiny little machine. Our, our speaker's not the best. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think it um, you know it's sort of it's connected back to this this cultural relativism question. Okay. Um, uh, he was asking about the British banning the practice of of widow burning. Oh yeah, that's the key, right? Yeah. Um, am, I, am I fairly characterizing your question? Yeah, I was talking about the concept of can cultural relativism both exist and have natural rights, saying ours is based on natural rights and yours is based on your ideas of cultural relativism, but we're going to treat you the kind of coexisting where you can do what you want, but what you do doing your real wrong in our perspective is, is evil. And we're going to treat you according to our laws. Like, can that co can you have you, the, the argument that the British made when they went to Britain, when they, when they went to India? And they said, you can do what you want and you can burn your widows, but in our, but we're going to do what we want where we kill up widow burners. Do you think that's a, that's a valid argument? Like that's a, it's a good, that's a, that's a way to look at it or no? No, I think the idea here is that, and this is actually something I write a lot about in the book is that if you stick to natural law principles, um, natural law rights, life, liberty, property, security, uh, and you, you don't go too off, too far off the farm, then you don't really need to worry as much about these that kind of cultural relativist position uh, because the United States wouldn't, shouldn't ever uh, forcibly intervene to prevent cultural practices that don't touch upon those, those absolute rights. Um, but the problem, of course, is that those rights all sound simple and none of them are. Uh, the, the right to bodily security, would that include, for example, something like uh, mutilating women, which happens in certain parts of Africa um, when, they're, when they're children? Is that, it's a cultural practice, um, but it's also mutilation. So is, it, is that something that falls within the natural law rubric? And those are the kinds of questions without answering them myself, which would be you know, well beyond my, my pay script scale. Um, those are the kinds of questions that we should be asking. Those are the kinds of questions that everyone should be asking is uh, how exactly can we engage with the other nations of the world and where do we draw the line between cultural practices and conduct that's simply beyond the pale? And you know, you raised the example of, of the British in India. And I think that's actually, that's kind of the, the anchor chain on that conversation because we are still living in a post-imperial world. And uh, we are still living with the consequences of nations that went into places like India and said, well, not only burning widows, but here's all these other, you know, uh, polygamy and all this other stuff. It's all, this is just terrible. How could you possibly do this? These people are, are, are horrible. And we have to bring you up to our standard. And we have to be able to talk to other nations in the world without sounding like we're condescending to them because we're not. Uh, we're simply trying to make sure that a baseline of, of human rights is being obeyed. One more? Um, no more on chat. Somewhere, you know, 
<laughs> you know, I don't have a clock, so I'm, I'll take your word uh, for it. It's, it's not a charm. Uh, look, oh, I, just, I, I so enjoyed reading this book. I Thank so enjoyed you. this conversation. I have maybe some more questions for you that we'll do. Uh, you know, another time, sure. but, um, but thank you so, so much and congratulations oh, again. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a lot of fun. I appreciate it.